Uh, we're going to be talking about the story of e-cigarettes, vaping, illness, and death. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with what's been going on in the last several weeks, at least in the news. Um, this is one of the things that got me really interested in this um, topic. It was a Time Magazine article about a month ago um, that talked about how Juul hooked kids and ignited a public health crisis. And, and really, I think um, it's a big part of the story, but it's not the only story. So how did we really get here to where we're at? I'm going to give you a very brief pictorial history. And unfortunately, it has to start with tobacco, because that's really what led to where we're at today. It's kind of an arc of history. Um, in the 1600s, um, there was, after the colonists introduced tobacco to Europe, um, there were treatises, as you can see, panacea, the universal medicine being a discovery of the wonderful virtues of tobacco taken in a pipe. So even back then, people were making outrageous medical claims, not too dissimilar to the marijuana situation today, I think. Um, at the same time, King James, in the early 1600s, wrote this counterblast, it's called, to tobacco, uh, where he blamed tobacco for scurvy and other maladies. Um, he seemed to be a real opponent of tobacco, uh, probably because the Spanish were, the, were making all the money off of it. By the time he died in the 1620s, he wasn't so opposed to tobacco because the British colonists were now, uh, had now were farming tobacco, selling tobacco. Um, in fact, tobacco was so popular as a, um, it was actually the first cash crop in the Americas, in the, in the British colonies. And um, it, it was so bad that the farmers were planting only tobacco and not food. And that actually led to famines in the early 1600s. And they mandated that farmers had to actually start, had to parcel out some of their acreage for food rather than tobacco. It also was the major driver of slavery in this country. So really, there's nothing good has, has come from tobacco big money and, and bad things. Let's fast forward 300 years. So it's all about the nicotine. By the late 1950s, the tobacco industry scientists had acknowledged internally, not to the public, but internally in their own documents, the link between smoking and lung cancer, as well as other diseases. By the 1960s, the industry recognized the importance of nicotine addiction, and without it, there would be no tobacco industry. With this in mind, it manipulated nicotine levels and its delivery in cigarettes, as it was understood that cigarettes were simply a nicotine delivery device. And while publicly denying the role of tobacco and cigarettes in causing lung cancer and other diseases, there was internal debate within the tobacco industry about actually creating a safe, si safer cigarette. So this is from 1958, a Philip Morris internal company document I know this sounds like a wild program, but I'll bet the first company to produce a cigarette claiming a substantial reduction in tars and nicotine will take the market. 20 years later, in, in a Liggett internal document, Liggett was another to big tobacco company, the first is concerned with the ethical question, is it morally permissible to develop a safe method for administering a habit-forming drug when, in so doing, the number of addicts will increase. So there was actually some, some moral sensibility here at Liggett, and Liggett actually turned out to be the only tobacco company to break ranks with the other tobacco company, uh, the other big tobacco companies, and admit to, admit guilt in deceiving the American and worldwide public um, as to the dangers of tobacco, and actually settled outside of the major tobacco agreement um, a couple years before the tobacco agreement. But back in the 50s and 60s, while, while they were claiming that cigarettes were safe, um, they tried to lay any health concerns by using images and surveys of doctors in their ads. And they tried to show that you know, tobacco was healthy, so they pictured athletes. But they were, but they were also an equal opportunity purveyor of death. They didn't really care who they targeted, as long as they bought their product. 
African-American athletes were used to target the African-American community and menthol cigarettes actually were preferred by the African-American community and they specifically targeted the African-American community to menthol, mentholated cigarettes. That's Willie Mays and Jackie Robinson if you don't recognize them. But what about the other half of the market? You know, up until, you know, around then, most, most of the people that smoked were men. But what about women? We've got a whole other market out there, the other half of the market. So they market it as a diet aid for women. And they marketed it as a diet aid for men. Women were actually liberated to smoke and they get their very own cigarette. I'm sure the older people in the audience remember these ads. And of course they needed to hook the next generation. This was really critically important. I remember Mama and Papa for Mother's Day and Father's Day, little Mikey's giving them Chesterfields. And of course, who can forget Joe Camel? Probably the younger residents don't remember him. But so R.J. Reynolds ran a series of ads in the, seven, in the 70s and 80s. We don't advertise to children. First of all, we don't want young people to smoke. And we're running ads saying specifically at young people, advising them that we think smoking is strictly for adults. Kids just don't pay attention to cigarette ads. At the same time, internally, RJR was writing, younger adult smokers have been the critical factor in the growth and decline of every major brand and company over the last 50 years. The renewal of the market stems almost entirely from 18 year olds. No more than 5% of smokers start after the age of 24. If younger adults turn away from smoking, the industry must decline just as population which does not give birth will eventually dwindle. And in 1991, a JAMA a JAMA article stated that by the age of six years old in, in their studies, old Joe, that's old Joe Camel, is re as well recognized as Mickey Mouse. So they were definitely targeting kids. And in their internal dark documents, the target demographic for um, cigarette smoking was 14 to 24. In 1964, the Surgeon General came out with his landmark report linking smoking to heart disease and other uh, lung cancer and other lung diseases and other diseases, other cancers, which had been accumulating for de literally decades. Meanwhile, the tobacco companies continued to deny there were any linkage. In 1965, the first e-cigarette basically was invented um, by Herbert Gilbert, who was trying to come up with a safer cigarette. Well, it never really caught on because it didn't need to. Everybody was smoking back then. And you could see the rise of cigarette smoking from 1900 all the way up through the World War II to the first Surgeon's General Report. And then after that, a gradual decline in smoking because of all the things that were put in place, including you know, prohibitions on public smoking, secondhand smoke, tobacco, excise taxes, increasing the price, stopping uh, TV advertising. So over 50 years, we made a tremendous amount of progress. This is probably one of the biggest public health um, success stories, I think, over the last century. Um, from, in 1964, 45% of Americans smoked. Today, it's only 14%. This is adults. That's the lowest percentage ever recorded. So we, they've done an amazing job in, in getting rid of smoking. And you can see the decline in adults and also the decline there in teens in the orange from 36.5% down to 7.6% in about 2015. But look where vaping came in, right around 2013, 2014. So today, even though we've made great strides, still 480,000 people die of cigarette smoking at an annual cost of $170 billion. And the tobacco companies continue to spend $26 million a day on advertising. All right, so let's talk about nicotine, because that's really the heart of the first epidemic. So nicotine, um, this is how nicotine um, interacts with the neurotransmission um, and reward pathway. Nicotine binds to receptors in the ventral tegmental area of the brain 
here. And then impulses travel down the neurons to the prefrontal cortex where dopamine's released and um, dopamine binds to receptors on other neurons. This leads to rewarding effects of smoking, such as relaxation, a buzz, or an increased ability to focus. And this is virtually the same pathway that is used in every addiction, every drug addiction. Um, and nicotine is as addictive or even more addictive than heroin, cocaine, and alcohol. The problem is it takes a long time for this, these pathways to really be um, fully developed. And as kids start vaping nicotine or smoking cigarettes with nicotine, um, their inhibitory pathways aren't as developed as this pathway that I just showed you. It lags behind the addiction pathways. Um, and nicotine basically hardwires the addiction pathways in children and young adults until the age of 25. Um, at this point, it becomes extremely difficult to quit the addiction, and the hard wiring of these addiction pathways really increases the likelihood of becoming addicted to other drugs. So what are the health effects of nicotine itself? Well, you know, tobacco has lots of, you know, thousands of compounds, some of which are carcinogenic, but nicotine also has, can have bad effects, which has been kind of underestimated, I think. Um, probably it causes hypertension, tachycardia, probably contributes to coronary artery disease, um, has GI symptoms, joint pains. You can see there's, it could go on and on, increases insulin resistance. Um, so it has a lot of side effects. It's not benign. Okay, so now we're going to talk about e-cigarettes and vaping. So what is vaping? Um, and I have to admit, I didn't know a lot about all this until about two months ago, about a month ago. And I've been kind of submerged, and you can ask my wife, I've been kind of <laughs> submerged in this topic for the last, actually consumed by this topic for the last month. Vaping is a word used to describe the use of an electronic system to deliver inhaled drugs. It's most commonly nicotine and cannabinoids, both um, natural or synthetic forms of marijuana, and we'll talk about that later. Another term that's sometimes used is juuling, which is basically to describe the use of a specific vape device, which we'll talk about also. In 2003, a Chinese pharmacist invented the first generation, what's considered the first generation e-cigarette. He was a smoker, his father was a smoker and died of lung cancer, and he really did want to create a safer cigarette. Um, and that Ru, Ruyan e-cigar was first launched in China in 2004, and still a lot of vaping products come from China, at least the devices. So this is a slew of the different devices out there, everything from on the right, the e-pipe to the e-cigar. The ones in the middle are um, tank devices. These are medium and small size tanks. This is a large tank. The tanks are filled with the liquid. These are disposable e-cigarettes, so they, were, they had a battery in them and then you just throw them away after you were done. And this is the new, newest generation, and that's the Juul, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. These are rechargeable, pod-based devices. So what are the, what's normally put in these? Well, with the e-cigarettes the e um, generally contain nicotine, flavorings, propylene glycol, vegetable glycerin, these are mainly used for, to, as a vehicle to create the vapor. Um, cannabinoids can be used, other substances, and there's different e-liquid types. There's refillable e-liquid, commercial non-refillable pods, and then there's tons of homemade or street sources, which we'll also mention later. So this is the new epidemic, e-cigarettes and nicotine addiction. So this is epidemic number one. After a 40-year decline in tobacco product use amongst youths, in 2018, 4 million high school students and 840,000 middle school students currently used any tobacco product, and e-cigarettes were the most commonly used product. This was driven by, and driven by an increase in e-cigarette use. Current tobacco product use significantly increased amongst high school and middle school students during 2017 and 2018. So you can see here, this is 2011 in the blue, and the most current is 2019. So you can see this drop-off amongst high school students in the use of tobacco cigarettes, 
And at the same time, look at what's happened to e-cigarettes. It's gone from essentially zero to 27.5% this year. And that's um, in all high school students, all grades. Um, we went to a dinner party recently, and there was a, one of the people at the dinner party, the daughter of uh, some of the people at the party, goes to an all-girl Catholic high school in Northern California. And we started talking about vaping, and I asked her, how many, you know, what percentage of your friends vape? She said 90%. So even though this number is 27.5%, this is a national survey, I'm very sure that in ver a lot of places in the country it's much, much higher than that. I think it's a gross underestimate. Not only that, but e-cigarette use has actually started to lead to more tobacco product use. So kids that are getting hooked on e-cigarettes are now trying regular cigarettes. So you can see over the last couple of years, the tobacco use has increased amongst high school students, not just e-cigarettes. And what do they think is in their e-cigarette? Well, two-thirds of them, when they were surveyed, thought that it was just flavors. That's, what they're, that's why they're vaping. It tastes good. They, they don't even know that there's nicotine in it. Only 13% knew that they were vaping nicotine. Um, five or six percent said marijuana, which is probably an underestimate also, um, and the rest just didn't know. So what's the role of big tobacco in all this? Big money, big marketing, and the salvation of a dying industry. Big tobacco is playing a big role in this. These are the historic decline, about five percent a year over the last several years since um, in cigarette consumption. This is the e-cigarette consumption. It's cutting into their market share, and it has been for a while. And they're not going to sit there and, and watch it happen, right? These are their customers, nicotine addicts. Um, Wells Fargo Securities put this out in 2011. This is a financial thing, right? E-cigarette profits could surpass those of combustible cigarettes within 10 years. That was in 2011. That's 2021. We're right there. It's about to cross. <clears throat> you can look in the financial you know, um, sources, Kramer, Mad Money, vaping is decimating the cigarette industry. Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, e-cigarette pioneers are holding their breath as big firms invade. So, you know, in the beginning, big tobacco was not involved in e-cigarettes. This was in 2013. This is the market in 2018, the end of 2018, so 10 months ago. 75% of the market was Juul. Look at the, the next several. Most of these are the big tobacco companies or owned by the big tobacco companies. And Juul itself has now been bought, a, 30, a third of Juul was bought by Altria um, this past year for $13 billion. And big tobacco has brought with it all their marketing that they've been, you know, were great at in the 60s and 70s before it was banned, in the 80s before they banned it. But you can see what they're marketing, freedom, health, taste, romance, sexuality, sociability, um, quitting, sm quitting smoking. That was supposedly why e-cigarettes were supposed to be a great thing, helping people quit. We'll talk about that in a minute. And I love this one. Circumvent smoke-free policies, dear smoking ban, blues. All right, flavors and marketing to youth. Marketing to kids, don't be ridiculous. Bubble gum, chocolate chip flavor, binky. You think this is funny, right? This is just a comic? Well, first of all, two-thirds of kids vape for flavors. These are the flavors. These are taken from the internet. These are products that are on the market, OK? Nilla wafer flavor, juice box. Root beer, Papa Smurf, tell me these are being marketed to adults. Or this one. For adults only, of course. 
Yeah, cotton candy, bubble gum, blue balls. Okay, so in 2014, how many flavors are there? In 2014, this study was done, Dr. Ashlock knows one of the authors of this paper in San Diego. They did some searches on the internet, whoops, and they found that in 2014, there were 466 brands on the internet, each with its own website, and 7,764 unique flavors. Unique flavors. I don't even know how you could get that many flavors. <laughs> I thought it was just like sweet, salty, sour, bitter, isn't it four flavors? I don't know, 7,700 7, flavors. And that was increasing at 10 and a half brands and 242 new flavors per month. This was five years ago. How many do you think are out there now? Do the math. It must be 20 or 30,000 different flavors and thousands of companies marketing this stuff. Well, the FDA tried to ban flavors years before the vaping outbreak, and unfortunately, top Obama officials rejected the plan. This might be the, one of the biggest blunders of the Obama, you know, the whole uh, Obama will go down as one of the biggest blunders they ever made. And they were basically invaded by tobacco company and vaping company lobbyists. And they, and they, didn't, they didn't ban flavors. This was back uh, probably in 2015 or 2016. And I think if they had done that, we'd have a much smaller problem right now. Then there's all these other vaping products. I showed you the, the standard ones. Here's a hoodie that you can vape through. Basically just vape on the string to the hoodie so no one can see it. Here's a vape watch for $34.95, sold out. Okay, this stuff's all on the internet. You can find this stuff in seconds, literally seconds. Um, basically, you pop this out and you vape with it. Then you pop it back in and it looks like a regular, you know, like a smartwatch. It's an Apple. All right, what about the rise of Juul? So this is the Juul. It's a rechargeable device that looks kind of like a thumb drive. It's a little bigger, but it recharges in your computer or any USB port. It has a pod up here that's filled with liquid. This part is the battery and the heating coil. The pods are, ref are um, supposedly equivalent to about a pack of cigarettes, 200 puffs per pod. They're flavored. They contain 5% nicotine by weight. Here's the flavors that Juul sells, lots of them. We know that you're finding your flavor is essential to a successful switching journey. Well, what else? So what's so special about Juul, other than the fact that it looks really cool? The marketing is like Apple's, you know, their product design is like an Apple product. It looks like an Apple. The, the website, the device, everything, it's really slick, which is why it caught on with, with kids, um, or at least part of it. Juuls are unique from other e-cigarettes in that they use nicotine salts rather than free-based nicotine. Nicotine salts are um, basically absorbed much more rapidly and more completely, and they reproduce the effects of conventional cigarettes. Until this came out on the market, e-cigarettes really weren't going anywhere. They've been around five or six years, and nothing was happening in that market. It really hadn't grown that much. Um, but when this hit the market, it just took off. Um, and part of the reason why it took off is it's much more addicting than any other device that was on the market because it used nicotine salt. It used benzoic acid to try and cut down on the harshness of the, of the nicotine. Um, so it was easier, easier to inhale, especially for kids. And then they flavored it. This is the absorption of nicotine from a cigarette after a puff, a jewel, so it's almost the same, and here's the average cigarette at the time Juul came out. Now a lot of the other companies are coming out with nicotine salts to try and catch up because this is really what it's all about. It's all about nicotine. The higher the concentration you, know, you can get, the more addictive potential it has. And the more, you know, whatever it is that you get from nicotine in terms of a, of a, you know, a um, boost or whatever. Um, Nicotine concentration in Juul was 5%. Um, 
in UK, where they probably the only country that advocates e-cigarettes as a quit smoking um, mechanism, um, EK, UK, the United Kingdom made said Juul could not market this product in the United Kingdom at this concentration. They only allow 1.7 percent, so a third of um, what they market in the United is what is sold in the United States and the rest of the world. And that's because they realized how addictive this device was because of the nicotine um, effects. And now we're seeing kids and other people with nicotine poisoning. This is something you like never had heard of from cigarettes. Um, but nicotine poisoning can happen both from kids swallowing you know, liquid, young kids swallowing um, liquids from the vaping pods or other devices. Um, but kids are actually developing this just from vaping. They're vaping so frequently. There are kids that are apparently waking up in the middle of the night to vape. I mean, who, it's like unfathomable that a, you know, a teenager would wake up in the middle of the night for anything, right? <laughs> Try and get them out of bed. And they're actually getting out of bed several times a night to vape because they're so addicted. And of course, they marketed just like the tobacco companies did to young people. Do these look like adult, you know, middle-aged smokers that they're trying to get to quit? That's what they claimed and are still claiming. This is one of the ads. This is the old cool cigarette ads. Kind of looks familiar, doesn't it? Crown Jewel. So within three years, they took over 75% of the market. And they're now valued at more than Ford Motor Company or Target. In three years, that's the valuation of Jewel. That's how big this business is. But e-cigarettes can help me quit smoking. That's the line, right? That's why they were invented, to help people quit. Supposedly a safer cigarette. Well, e-cigarettes is a cessation aid. Um, multiple studies have shown inconsistent abstinence outcome differences. The biggest study was in the New England Journal last year. 866 patients were randomized to e-cigarettes versus their choice of nicotine replacement therapy, and both groups got behavioral therapy for four weeks. At one year, the e-cigarette group abstinence from smoking was 18% versus about 10% in the nicotine replacement group. That was like gum, patches, other nicotine replacement. But note this, and they don't make a point of this in the article. You have to, you have to look at the, at, the st at the tables. At one year, 80% of the tobacco abstinent e-cigarette group was still using e-cigarettes, while only 9% of the tobacco abstinent nicotine replacement group was still using nicotine replacement. So these people, who were vaping or using e-cigarettes were still addicted. They switched from tobacco to e-cigarettes, but they were still addicted to nicotine, 80% of them. Well, only 10 per, less than 10% that switched using, you know, quit using other products um, were still using nicotine replacement. So 90% of them had quit nicotine completely. What about other drugs that weren't even included in this study? Bupropion and nicotine replacement results in one-year quit rates of 20%. That's just as good as that. Varenicline alone has a 26% abstinence rate at 26 weeks. So don't let anybody tell you that the, this is a, you know, a panacea or a, a great aid for quitting smoking. It's not. It's not any better than other things that we have on the market. There's nothing really special about it. Plus, the only thing that's special is 80% of them are still addicted to nicotine. So they're going to keep buying it for the rest of their life. So in summary, that's pretty much what I just said there. Um, Ari Atkins at Pax Labs, which is an e-cigarette company engineer, said, we don't think a lot about addiction here because we're not trying to design a cessation product at all. He added, anything about health is not on our mind. They're just trying to sell nicotine. They've got a product and they want everybody to use it. So other quit smoking interventions are at least or more effective, achieving abstinence at one year, and only a few of those actually remain nicotine dependent. Nevertheless, they say, why quit? Switch to blue. 
because we want you as a customer for, your, for life. And this one, which would you choose for your nicotine addicted patient? The cigarette on the right with all of these known pro whoops, all of these known problems and all of these thousands of chemicals, or this, which only has a few things, and it's fine. Yeah, maybe it causes addiction. Or, or does it? Or is that all it does? This just came out a few weeks ago. Electronic cigarette smoke induces lung cancer and bladder um, ure urothelial hyperplasia, which is a pre-malignant tumor in mice. Okay, so this is the first time e-cigarettes have been associated with these kind of health effects. They've seen DNA effects in uh, previous to this, the same group, and now they've actually demonstrated it in mice. They basically exposed mice to vape for four hours a day for a year. And, and it was a randomized study, and the only difference was nicotine between the vape in one and the vape in the other. So it wasn't the vehicles, it wasn't all the other stuff that was in the aerosol, it was the nicotine. So nicotine is probably carcinogenic. I don't think anybody's been able to sort that out in the past, or even maybe they never even looked for it. So what else is in e-cigarettes? Lots of stuff. So they tell you about this stuff, but when they analyze it, there are all of these other things in there. That's the liquid. The aerosol that's generated has even more. Why is that? Because a lot of these compounds are converted to other compounds from the heat. And what, you know, anybody that's taken chemistry knows when you mix a bunch of chemicals together, how do you accelerate the process? You heat it, right? So now you've got a lot of flavors with lots of chemicals that are not, you know, th probably thousands of different chemicals out there that are being heated with this and producing who knows what. They have no idea. No one has any idea. This is a totally unregulated market. So is it really a safer cigarette? Well, one epidemic begat the next. So we talked about the first epidemic, nicotine addiction. That led to what we're dealing with now, which is epidemic number two, e-cigarette and vaping product associated lung injury. And it also led to vaping all these things, other things besides nicotine, which has also led into this epidemic. So it's really twin epidemics, and it was driven by this. So this was a report from early September um, in the New England Journal. It was the first group of cases, clusters of cases in Illinois and Wisconsin that were recommended. Um, as a new pulmonary illness related to e-cigarette use. So I'm gonna show you some slides that are a mixture of this report as well as some of the CDC compilation of statistics since that time. And remember, since that time, we're talking about less than two months ago. Um, a lot of the statistics have not really changed in terms of percentages. So this is from the CDC last week. Um, in the, some of the cases they've analyzed, the median age is 22. The range was 13 to 71. Respiratory symptoms, mainly shortness of breath, cough, chest pain. GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. The GI symptoms tend to resolve pretty quickly, usually within a few days. But they also get constitutional symptoms of fever, chills, and unexpected weight loss. Um, so you can see 95% have respiratory symptoms, 77% GI, and 85% constitutional. More than half had an oxygen saturation of less than 95% while breathing room air. The majority were tachycardic and tachypnic, or about half. And about half were admitted of these cases were admitted to the intensive care unit with the highest percentages at the extremes of age, at the young, at the kids, the teens, and then the people over 50. Intubation, about half the ones that were, were admitted to the ICU ended up getting intubated. They were in respiratory failure. <coughs> and again, you'll see in a minute, uh, there's kind of a bimodal distribution. In terms of labs, this is from the original report, the white count 
87% were elevated, mostly neutrophils, sed rate was up. Um, other labs were pretty unremarkable, a little bit of a transaminase rise and a few in, in uh, AST rise in about half. Procalcitonins never really went up very much, about 0.58, because it's not a bacterial infection, presumably. Abnormal chest x-ray, 91%. So almost all of them have an abnormal chest x-ray, and 100% of them had abnormal chest CT. So if you suspect it and their x-ray is normal, you should probably get a chest CT, and they always show bilateral infiltrates. This is the bimodal distribution. Kids and older people have the most intubations. Older people have the longest lengths of stay. So what do you want to ask about? You need to ask about symptoms. As you can tell from what I've already said, the symptoms are really similar to pneumonia, right? It's almost indistinguishable from a severe respiratory illness. Um, but you also want to ask about GI symptoms, and especially you want to talk about vaping. Ask them if they use e-cigarettes, if they vape, what they vape, um, how often, when they last vaped. If you can get them to bring in the device and what they vaped, the public health department, I'm sure, can get it analyzed and would love to do that. So if you see any patients like this and you can get them to bring in the device and the, and the pod or whatever liquid they're vaping, um, please do that. On physical exam, probably the most important thing is the oxygen saturation, and the CDC actually recommends anybody with an oxygen saturation less than 95% should be admitted to the hospital. Um, you can get a chest CT, um, and the big thing is you want to rule out pneumonia. You want to rule out an infection. So you want to do all the stuff you would normally do when you admit somebody with pneumonia. You get a you know, strep pneumo urinary antigen, legionella urinary antigen, respiratory viral panel, uh, mycoplasma, if it actually works, um, and you know, cult sputum cultures, blood cultures. And this is the case definition the CDC put out. It's basically use of an e-cigarette vaping or dabbing, and I'll talk about that in a minute, in 90 days before symptom onset. So that's what they're using as their case um, with bilateral pulmonary infiltrates on chest x-ray or CT and um, absence of an infection. A probable case is basically the same thing with an infection, but you don't think the infection can cause the severity of the symptoms that, or the presentation. So, like I said, admitting people with SATs less than 95, if they're outpatients, you should probably see them back in a few days if they don't meet that criteria, because a lot of them get worse in the first 48 hours. Consider steroids if you rule, once you rule out infections. Um, most of these patients were treated with steroids, but I can't find any reference anywhere to how much or how long or any, there's no, nothing on it. They just say, use steroids. Um, and whether it actually does anything, I don't know if anybody knows that either. But I think the feeling from the people treating them is that it did. Um, so if they're not admitted, follow them up in 24 to 48 hours. If they are discharged from the hospital, follow up chest x-ray, consider um, PFTs, and most importantly, cessation and, and preventive care. Um, strongly advise them not to ever use e-cigarette or vaping products again. Hopefully they won't. Um, give them flu shots and pneumonia shots. So this is some of the pathology. It's really bronchocentric um, inflammation is a, a big characteristic. You can see, um, that's up here, you can see foamy macrophages um, and it can progress to basically diffuse alveolar damage or ARDS. This is imaging. So here's CT scans. There's various patterns that you can see. Diffuse alveolar damage, acute lung injury, acute eosinophilic pneumonia, lipoid pneumonia. Lipoid pneumonia was initially thought to be a big part of this. Um, some people were suggesting that vitamin E, which is often used as a thickener in the liquid, um, was causing this whole problem. But actually, when they went back and looked at the pathologic specimens, Almost none of them had lipoid pneumonia, and they don't really think that's the big problem. 
diffuse salvia, but lipoid pneumonia has definitely been described it with vaping. In fact, one of our ex-residents did a case report four years ago on that um, and down at Cedars. Diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, giant cell interstitial pneumonia. This is a case that we actually had two weeks ago here at Cottage. It's a 19-year-old female who, was, who was, had been vaping. Um, I don't know a lot of the details. Well, I wasn't taking care of her, Dr. Ashlock was. This is the CT scan. Um, you can see nodular, kind of dense nodular infiltrates as well as ground glass infiltrates and it's pretty diffuse bilaterally. Okay, so this is the latest data from last week. The next data is coming out at, well, probably just came out. I didn't have time to get it into this. It was coming out today. As of last week, 49 states, the District of Columbia, and one territory have reported cases, and there were a total of 1,479 cases. 70% were male. The median age was 23 with a range of 8, 13 to 75. About 80% are less than 35, and 15% are less than 18 years old. 33 deaths have been reported in, 14, in 24 states, three of which are in California. The range of a, in age was 17 to 75 years old. 78% reported using THC. 58% reported using nicotine-containing products. 31% exclusively THC, and 10% exclusive nicotine. So we don't really know what the hell is going on, honestly. We don't know what is causing this. Um, whether it's something in the nicotine, something flavoring the nicotine, whether it's the THC, most of the, page, most of the um, cases have reported using THC, and the majority of those are black market products. This is the California data that came out last week. 133 cases in California. We lead the nation. Um, three deaths. I constructed these graphs from the CDC re weekly reports that they've been putting out. You can see this is August 30th. That's last week. This is six weeks. This is what's been happening. That's the epidemic. So there's lots of adverse effects from vaping. I found this graphic, and I had to add this to it. Vaping-associated pulmonary illness, shortness of breath, cough, respiratory failure, and death. It's not as benign as once thought. On the bright side, he stopped smoking, he died from vaping. So what causes vaping? Well, popcorn lung is one possibility. Diacetyl is, a is used in flavorings. And it was first described popcorn lung in a microwave popcorn plant back in 2000. It was used for the butter flavoring in, pop in microwave popcorn. And a lot of the people that were working at the plant got bronchiolitis obliterans from it. So that's one of the things that's very common in flavors uh, for vaping. Um, what about this? Danks. I don't know if anybody's heard of that, but Danks is allegedly, uh, it's the most prominent in a class of largely counterfeit brands with common packaging that is easily available online and is used by distributors to market THC containing cartridges. It's a black market brand that has inspired loyalty online, but actually it's not a brand. They act like a cannabis company, but they actually don't exist. It's a packaging company. They basically pack it, they create packaging. These are just people filling cartridges as dank vapes. It's not a singular facility. It's just people in their garages filling them and selling them. So anybody can buy the empty cartridges and, and packaging, fill it with whatever they're gonna fill it with and sell it. And that's what's happening. And some companies on the internet are even, does this look reminiscent? Advertising where the illegal company claims to be recommended by doctors for their patients. So what else is in there? Well, they found hydrogen cyanide because there's this fungicide, microbutanil, which, can be tran which transforms into hydrocyanide, hydrogen cyanide when burnt. 
They've also, this company in Colorado, this lab, has found cadmium, which is in silver solder, that's actually the devices, some of the cheaper devices are made with silver solder that are contaminated with cadmium, and cadmium causes a known pneumonitis. And the symptoms and the findings are very similar to um, vaping-associated pulmonary injuries. So some of the devices themselves may be causing the problem. We don't really know. There's no consistency from one report to another. There's no one single thing that's turned up um, that as a cause of this illness. And it's probably, as I showed you, since it's got multiple pathologic and radiologic manifestations, it's probably a lot of different things. What about weed wax? Anybody heard of that? I, I never heard of any of this stuff before a couple months ago. <laughs> Highly concentrated form of marijuana, which is honey colored with a consistency of jello or butter. It's made by placing a large amount of weed in a tube or pipe and blasting it with butane. Extracts highly concentrated THC from the marijuana. It's 2000 degree heating process can and has led to explosions and fires. Weed wax is 80% THC, so it's highly concentrated THC, eight times as much as in marijuana buds that are typically smoked. Weed wax or oil can be smoked, vaped, whatever. These are the synonyms, so marijuana oil, dabs, BHO, butane hash oil, 710, which is oil upside down, very creative. Dabs, if you hear about dabbing, that's what they're talking about. And why they call it dabs? Because it's so concentrated, you only need a little dab on, in your vape pen to get high from it, which was for the older folks in the audience might be reminiscent of something. A little dabble do ya, the old Brill Cream ads, right? It was a hair tonic or something, a hair cream, I guess, uh, back in the 50s and 60s. And I thought of that, and I went on the internet, and clearly I wasn't the only one that thought of it. <laughs> Refillable pods. So these things can be filled with any liquid. Very simple. You can do it at home. People can do it, seal them, and sell them. All right. Um, other drugs that can be vaped, DMT, which is a vaping drug with hallucinogenic effects. Some say it's the most powerful psychedelic in the world. Spice, which is a synthetic ca cannabinoid, doesn't contain any THC, and it's untraceable on most at-home drug tests. Flocka, which is a stimulant similar to meth and cocaine. So what can be safely vaped in a pen and what will kill you? This was something I found on a day in the life of a whistleblower. New generations of vape pens that can vape anything you want with the, without the need of a carrier oil. They have ceramic quartz and titanium heating chambers and plates designed for herbs, concentrates, powders, and liquids. These devices go way beyond a jewel or even pod-based disposable vapes. 17 weird things you can vape. I don't know, I, you know, some are highly toxic. Everything from catnip to hand sanitizer. I don't know why anybody would want to vape that. But this is out there. This is on the internet. You find this in seconds, literally, these things. All right, so in summary, I'm almost done. Patients developing vapey have used cigarettes, vape pens, other vaping devices, which contain um, many different components of the devices and made of a variety of materials which when heated may release toxic chemicals like cadmium. Patients developing vapey have vape flavored and unflavored nicotine, THC, BHO, weed, wax, frequently mixtures of more than one which creates whole new compounds. So there are literally thousands of possible substances that are vaped and may be changed by the heating process of vaping. Um, epidemiologically, pathologically, radiologically, there are likely many causes of vapey. CDC recommends that no one vape, especially minors, young adults, pregnant women. If one previously smoked cigarettes, they should seek assistance with quitting using nicotine replacement therapy, varenicline, bupropion, etc., and not resume smoking cigarettes. And finally, as was the case with tobacco, any long-term effects of vaping could take actually decades to uncover. I mean, the long-term effects, we're just starting this. So what can we do now? Well, for one thing is we can ignore the smoke and mirrors that the vaping companies and the tobacco companies are putting out about this being safe. A demand for scientific proof is always a formula for inaction and delay and usually the first reaction of the guilty. 
In fact, scientific proof has never been, is not, and should not be the basis for political and legal action. This is an example of private candor from a scientist at the tobacco company, BAT, British American Tobacco, in 1980. So these are proposals you'll hear about and why they may be inadequate. Restricting the sale of e-cigarette and vaping products to persons over 21. It's unlikely to be very enforceable given internet access. Never stop kids from using tobacco, cigarettes, alcohol, or other substances legally available to adults only. What about banning flavors of e-juice? Well, it will help. Two-thirds of kids probably start because of the flavors, but a third of them don't. They don't mention flavors as the reason for vaping. So you catch some of them, maybe, but not all, or prevent some of them from starting, but not all of them. Banning THC and other cannabis-based liquids, the legality varies from state to state. It's still legal federal, by federal law. None of the above would prevent the sale of, or vaping of thousands of other substances which are available online and in the future. And since we have no idea what's causing this, um, you know, it's obviously a huge issue. I thought this was really in in interesting. India and China block e-cigarette sales. Are you kidding me? You know, India, which is not really known for their public health, right? Why are we debating if it's more harmful or less? It is harmful. It is addictive, said Preeti Sudan, India's health secretary. The ne entire next generation will be going down the drain if we don't control it now. This is coming out of India. I don't know what we're doing. So this is what I think we should do. The only real solution to all of this would be to ban everything. Ban the e-cigarette vaping devices, the pods and cartridges um, that are used with them. Block all internet sales, um, because probably a lot of it, if not most of it, is online. In the future, if e-liquid containing nicotine is found to be safe, which I kind of doubt, but if it is, might be possible to highly regulate e-cigarettes as an actual medical device, which is what it was supposed to be when it was introduced to help people get off of tobacco. Ban refillable pods, cartridges, e-liquids, and only permit the sale of non-flavored nicotine and re non-refillable pods to persons over 21. And probably, while it's non-prescription, it would probably should be restricted to either behind the counter in pharmacies like they do with Sudafed or highly regulated storefront shops. And really importantly, enforcement of laws to allow only re legally regulated devices if that day ever comes, products and stores and prevent black market sales is really critical. 80% of THC in, or marijuana products in California are sold illegally today. 80%. So the legal market is a fraction of the overall market, and the enforcement is just not there. So <laughs> that concludes my talk. Any questions? I'm sorry I went over. Thank you. Yeah, so Joe. One thing, um, do I need a, uh, so one thing that was really powerful in the tobacco was the fact that an employer allowed smoking in their um, their workplace, they could be sued for any uh, unsafe workplace. And that started with the airline stewardess who mm -hmm. said we can't step out of our uh, airline for breath of fresh air. Right. So really vaping or anything like that should never be in any kind of uh, public place where it's exposing other people. I think that's a really important thing that's well, I think that it is, um, in, at least in, I think in California, I know in Santa Barbara, it's not allowed indoors in facilities. Um, it, you know, that was all brought, at, those policies and laws and regulations were mainly brought about because of secondhand smoke. Right. Somebody asked me about secondhand vape today, and I don't know that there's any data on that at this point. But that's really what drove those policies. And yes, absolutely, those policies were critical in the decline of smoking. Yeah. And I think they need to, if they aren't already in for, you know, using those policies for vaping like they are for cigarettes, they need to be in states. I'm sure there are other states that are not doing that. Any other questions? Well, thank you for an excellent talk and overview of those uh, medical aspects and that historical and 
political analysis and economic analysis as well. Um, I, I completely agree with you about the statistics that we're seeing uh, from the CDC as grossly underestimating, and especially here in Santa Barbara, um, as a parent of, I have a senior in high school and a ninth grader and another younger one who's not involved yet, but it is especially uh, in a middle uh, class or even upper class social set, super pervasive. I, I can almost, you know, my kids will tell me that there's almost very few kids. I would say that 90% estimate is very accurate here in school. Banning it in certain locations is not effective. The kids are vaping in the back of the class when the teacher turns around, the puff of smoke is gone. Uh, the bathrooms are filled with it. Um, the dabbing with uh, weed is super pervasive as well in this community. Um, and I'm wondering uh, if you came across any best practices for uh, parents working with their teens to try to dissuade them because uh, uh, telling them uh, about it or, or you know, it's, it's grossly ineffective when it is super common. I mean, the number of cases of vape illness is nil compared to the number of kids that vaped yesterday. But there'd be a line waiting outside the ICU 10 blocks long if this was commonly happening. So kids don't really uh, trust their parents or believe us if we say it may not be good for you. In fact, it's negligible, in my opinion, uh, the risk of vape-related illness. Yeah, I, you know, I don't have any magic answers for you. I think education is key. And how to educate kids that age, I'm not sure that I'm qualified to tell you. I'm not really, I don't know. But we have to get the message across. They certainly got the message from smoking. Um, and I showed you the statistics about how smoking, tobacco smoking, had really plummeted um, amongst youth until this happened. And um, I think that they did get the message. And, and these people are dying now, not 30 years from now or 40 years from now, which most teens don't really think about, right? They don't think about what's going to happen to them when they're 50. Um, but these, they, there are kids that are dying of this now. So somehow we have to get this message out. I think they are getting the message. There was one slide that I think I skipped over um, where just in the last two months, the number of people that had feel that e-cigarettes are at least as dangerous or more dangerous than tobacco smoking has gone up about 10 to 15 percent. Not sure if that was in kids or in adults or both in the survey. <clears throat> but I think you're right, it's critical. We have to we have to do something to get our kids to... Uh, Andy, it's got the microphone, and then, Lynn, you can have it next. So it would seem to me that rather than just worrying about our kids and our patients, that the medical community should um, get together and form a speaker's bureau or find some other way to um, uh, be an advocacy group against vaping for the entire community. And not doing that would seem to be, to be falling short of our roles as physicians. So I would propose to anyone here who's interested, I know there's pediatricians here, there's internists, there's family medicine docs, there's advanced practice, uh, advanced practice practitioners, nurse practitioners, PAs. Um, why don't we have an organized group? Either public health department can organize it, medical society, and, and really go for it. I, I feel like anything else would be shirking our response. I 100% agree with you. And I intend to actually, there's several groups out there that have contacted me and I'm willing to go out and speak to, you know, schools. Um, and I agree that it would be great if there was a whole, um, if there were a lot of physicians that were willing to do that because there's a lot of schools in this community. Yeah, Lynn. And so I was just going to say, I think in response to Thad's question, I think the education policy makers are actually focusing on third and fourth graders right now. Right. Because no, that's, that's correct. Because, again, not to say that Thad's older children are past, past <laughs> an opportunity, but I, I think the reality is by fifth and sixth grade, a lot of kids are already aware of it and already doing it. And that's, that's I think, as a parent, what I think I'm hearing. You're right. At least in the national surveys, 10% of middle school kids are already vaping. That's seventh and eighth grade. So yeah, I think we need to start in elementary schools. And the only other comment I mean, question I had was, given how staggering this rate of rise has been over the last 24 months, 
are we going to get to a place where maybe it's only the tip of the iceberg of, of the kids, the teenagers that are developing baby, but is it going to start affecting things like the influenza epidemic and pneumonia during the winter? Are we going to just really damage kind of the lungs, essentially, of a population of adolescents in a way that it could actually be affected by even those epidemics? That's just as you're going through it, it occurred to me. I don't know yeah, no, I think that's a great thought. I mean, I, I think it very well may impact those. Um, it's also going to be difficult to distinct dis during flu season to distinguish this from from influenza. Um, we've had three cases that I know of in this hospital already, and actually on my way over here today, one of the residents showed me a case that I think probably is another one. Um, the CT was very similar to what you just saw um, that was just admitted just today. So I think we're going to be seeing more of this. Yeah. Are we reporting these to the news? Um, are, are we reporting these cases so KTLA can, uh, or KLC can report it to say we had another case today at Cottage Hospital of making uh, pneumonia? I don't know. Unfortunately, the head of public health left, and probably that needs to come from them rather than from us directly because of HIPAA and stuff like that. But yeah, I think the new, so it should be reported in the report. news. I know that. Um, Channel 3 News did a whole thing on vaping um, last week, right? So um, they had a whole segment on it. So I, I mean, it's obviously out there and, and we're seeing a lot of stuff in the news. And yes, absolutely, I think it need, the message needs to get out that this isn't just somewhere else in the country, that this is happening in our own community. And didn't Dr. Ansar ask us to make sure that we report? So for example, yes. the one that came in today, We'll see it on our team, and then we'll actually deliberately call the health department tomorrow morning once we've confirmed our suspicion. Exactly, and as far as I know, all of the cases so far have been reported, and will be. Re and it's actually a, a mandate we're we're obligated to report them. But I think the public health department needs to kind of inform the the news media um, so that they can get that message out too. And Dr. Friesen. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, but also just going back to the school districts, it does look like at least Santa Barbara Unified is hosting some forums, um, and that's going to be next week. And I don't know if any of you guys as physicians are involved in that, um, but it looks like they are starting 6.30 Tuesday, October 29th at Washington um, Elementary. So I know that it is starting. Great. I mean, I think that's, that's what we need because this all starts with kids. If you haven't started by the time you're 24, you probably won't. That's, that's the history of smoking, and it's probably going to be the history with this, too. One other comment on, on cigarette uh, smoking. Health discontinuation. Tim Rogers isn't here. No. <laughs> um, is that one of the principles of the nicotine replacement uh, is that you maintain the nicotine levels, but you change the behavior. And so that usually after four or five months, behaviors, because it's hard to change the behavior than the detox. The detox is simple. Right. It's the retraining of the habit pattern. So that's why if you vape, you just maintain the pattern. That's right. It's, it's the, the same pattern. The Chantix, the replacement, they maintain a nicotine level, and then the behavioral part changes. That's the tougher part, and that's why you have the statistics you, you show. Absolutely. I agree. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all for coming.